happy. They may not be used to having somebody solicit what they're doing. That might not be something that is asked very often in certain departments. Um, but but in terms of the question of losing people, losing touch with folks, um, that's a scary idea to have a student being quietly um, decompensating in their apartment. I mean, it's important to stay connected. Yeah, we talked about that too, that it's not a, a common thing for people who haven't taught online to know the importance of building community and building presence and how important that is. It's usually considered, uh, you know, just a nice thing, but it's actually a very important thing, as Lauren mentioned earlier as well. Uh, the importance of knowing that we're there for them is really important and that they're there for each other is really critical. So it might be something that isn't considered, especially when we've been thrown into being remote. Uh, when we do about teaching online, we go into a lot about how important it is to build presence, but there wasn't any time to do that when we were doing this. So I think that's an important concept. What about one of the other groups? Would you like to share what your group talked about? Duncan? Turn on your There we go. Yeah, I had to get on mute. I was just Our group was talking a little bit about the challenges. One of our members was uh, not teaching and the other um, had a very different class. And we started talking about and sharing videos. Um, and uh, at the end, just before we were cut off, there was some discussion of you know kind of the quality, and I, I wanted to share something I found surprising and um, encouraging. About a week in after after having converted the course that I'm teaching, uh, so the end of the week after spring break, I, I made a Qualtrics survey, and essentially three questions. Uh, each question was a was a dial -a meter to ask to compare the the post spring break course to the pre spring break course where the post one had the the changes and um, online stuff. What did you find the, out? The thing I well that's interesting. So um, I did something which I'm which I would encourage you to do. So I made. Five was equivalent, and and zero is you know not most. I'm higher, and you know, some students actually prefer the class. The present formula. Hey, hey Duncan, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to jump in here. We're not able to hear you. Your, your, your through, connection you is going in and out quite a bit. A lab, so. I'm, I'm wondering if you're able to hear us as well. Um, it seems like our connection with you is, is is not great. Which is why I do a simple. I can hear you. Okay, I just heard why I do a, and then it cut out. Maybe if you could summarize that, because Duncan, I think you have some really interesting points. I'd like to hear it, but we are having some audio issues. So I don't know if there's any way. Could you summarize a tiny bit what you found out in the chat, if that's possible? Yeah, maybe we'll keep great. this in chat. Thank you. Great. And what about our sorry final about group? Uh, sorry about that, Duncan. It sounded like a really important thing to say. Um, but he has some low stats but interesting data that he created a Qualtrics survey to ask students to compare their post spring break. So we'll wait to hear what your results for that. If you could maybe say, it'd be interesting to know what they said. And what about our third group? Why Duncan is putting that in there. Anybody from the third group have anything they'd like to share? I can just make a, a couple of summative comments. Uh, we talked about the importance of balancing both flexibility and structure. Uh, so accommodating students um, with multiple ways for them to submit assignments or finish work, uh, along with the flexibility to skip some assignments. But uh, 
letting students know exactly what is essential, what is not essential, um, what could be skipped or changed or modified so that they don't have to figure those things out themselves in this time of chaos. I think maybe that encapsulates what roughly what we said. Great. Okay. I love the idea of the, the flexibility there and, and offering the students some agency and decision making abilities in their in their courses. Um, and you're right, having that guidance um, so that they know what changes they can make or not make, or that's great. And so some, I, students, I often, oh, uh, some students need, they need the autonomy and it's fine to give them a choice and, and encouraged. And other students who are simply floundering, uh, they cannot even handle choice. And so as long as you know who your students are and you can either offer them, you know, a choice of two things or for some of them, you just, you're basically more prescriptive. Um, they, some of them need that. So not only a choice of activities, but a choice on what kind of choices they get or don't get. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. I never thought of it that way before, because I always give choice, but I never thought that that could be a concern for students who just don't want to make a decision at this point. So that's really, yeah, it can be a gift or a curse. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting. And now we can hear a little bit more about Duncan, what he found out. He found that, uh, that the post was equivalent, five of 10, sometimes better, Sometimes it's worse for separately, lecture, discussion, and lab, all similar score distributions. The totally online is more convenient in many ways. As we always hear about how online is convenient, and as we get into some of these, you might even find that it's a preference for some people, not just convenience sake, but for learning sake. So very interesting. Well, thank you. I hope that group part was good. I'm going to turn this over to John now that he's with us here, do you want to explain the uh, lab sheet and we'll start answering some questions. And I will apologize again for being late on this. I don't know what happened in my brain, um, but it disappeared. Um, so, um, let me share, All right, so we have the activity sheet as you're familiar with, and let me just go ahead and share that out with you all now. And it should be showing up in front of you. And then again, the activity sheet, I'm putting the link so that you can jump into it as well um, on your, um, on another tab and open it up on another tab. So there we have, we've already gone through the tips that we have at the top here. Um, and again, these are not necessarily the, end all be all for the top tips. A lot of this is still, we're, we're figuring things out. So these are things that we've seen work or we've heard um, have, have worked. And we know that this, uh, these uh, align with good teaching and learning educational research. Um, but there's still some things that we can do here for that. Go ahead, Karen. A good one here as Duncan brought up here, number, if you scroll back up there, uh, so Duncan is doing number tip number, if you scroll up a little bit, they continue to ask your students. So I'm really glad that you provided that uh, survey to them. I think you got some really interesting back uh, information. And I say it's important, even if you don't do it formally in a survey, that you provide opportunities. I always like to have a just a form where they can post comments or questions. And even if you don't want to have the opportunity for a formal survey, you can have informal as well. So continue well, on, John. Those a lot of those, a lot of the, um, that feedback, you can build that directly into the assessments or into the assignments and the activities um, as an end quiz question. Um, what other questions could we have asked or, or should we have asked? Um, think about um, getting the feedback from your students about what's working in their other courses that you might not know about, but they're like, gosh, why doesn't this instructor do this thing? Um, they're making us do this other thing and they don't have any idea. Well, we don't have an idea about what's happening in their other courses unless we ask them. We can put that into the uh, surveys the way that Duncan did. We can build it into questions um, to get them to think about how some other teaching technique that they're experiencing in another classroom might be adopted to teach the content that they're learning. And any time that they do that, they're thinking about your content with a different part of their brain, a different way of thinking about it, and they're making connections to the other courses. So your content is getting connected to multiple parts of their lives. 
um, it's it's not a it's not a bad idea. Go ahead, Lauren. So all of this and what Duncan has been saying um, is getting me to reflect back on what I'm also hearing from the instructors I work with, which is that um, it's been a really good opportunity to identify what parts of what we do really do work better or feel better or whatever um, in a physical synchronous together environment and what parts of what we do can be done just as well asynchronously. So, yeah. I, you know, it'll be, I, I'm very, very interested in seeing how courses will evolve once this is all over. I've already had some of my instructors say, hey, you know, I was planning to teach using um, the two-way interactive video large classroom four days a week. Next fall, I kind of want to change that now. Can I do that? Is it too late to update the timetable so that we're only meeting twice a week or, or three times a week instead of four and that one day is, an, is more of an online day? So I'm really interested to see how all of this shakes out. Yeah, so I'm going to put in the chat uh, um, the KB document that has the policy on credit hours because I think that that, that point that you brought up is, is really a, a good one. Um, we are so used to um, time on task, I guess, and, or, or time in a seat rather, right? It's uh, one credit is what is three hours of work per credit. And one of those should be face-to-face um, -face interaction, right, with an instructor in theory. Um, but in real, realistically, it's not in this um, online environment. It doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. It doesn't have to be you talking with every individual student for this amount of time. What parts of these can be flipped, can be put into uh, lectures um, and chunked into smaller pieces and, and sent out for them to, to uh, work on on their own? And what, what pieces should we keep in a synchronous manner? So yeah, excellent questions. Um, let's get some more questions in here. Um, and the way that we do that is just grab some space after one of these red cues and type your question in. And we've got some down here below that you can grab into. And then we will try to respond. Again, our, our responses are not the end all be all. Um, but there's some ideas that will help us uh, get some conversation going on it. Also, if you have, a, if you see a question up there and you're like, oh, I want to, I want to talk about this question too. Go ahead and add a, a plus in front of it. And if we see some with several pluses in front of the question there, um, we will, we'll, we'll make sure that we hit it. good question posted there already. Uh, I think I know who posted this. Was this Eugene? And I have taught my asynchronous online courses for three semesters. Is that you, Eugene? Yes, that's me. Mm -hmm. I'm a good guesser, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, never in this COVID environment that my remote students are trapped in their homes and worrying about their futures in school, jobs, family. Do you think that offering some additional synchronous opportunities to gather folks if they choose? I'm inclined to do it, but they have signed up for a course that is asynchronous, not synchronous. Um, I'd love to get other people's thoughts, but my thought is why not? As long as it isn't required, it's just an optional, and you can also send out a brief survey on when people are available. As long as you keep it as an optional opportunity and you know if you can record it for those who can't make it I don't I don't see a, an issue with that I think it's really helpful what do other people think yeah I, I, I think it's, it's great one of the things that I remember early on with the social media phase was a, a, a huge rush for people to be oh we need to have a Facebook group we should have a Facebook group about this um, and I that was sort of a dangerous thing, and I, I will confess that I did that as well. Um, and I surveyed my students beforehand, saying, "How many of you have Facebook groups?" Thinking everybody would, and of course they they or Twitter, um, and they all you know many of them lied and said, "No, I don't," because they wanted to keep that separate from from their schoolwork. So I, I really appreciate that Jean said um, it's an opportunity if they choose not something that I would like require them or even require them to to 
join in on a Facebook group or a group me or um, some other sort of platform. I don't want to be in the position of choosing a platform for them outside of the campus supported platforms, Canvas and Piazza and, and, and places like that. Um, and again, these are not things that would ever be graded. Um, so what are the thoughts other than Facebook is evil? Yes. Duncan. Well, I like that they say here that they want that community connection or for that matter, any connection with someone outside of their current living environment. And they have been getting tired of the people with them. My poor husband well, is trapped here with me. <laughs> so this is, this is also a, a, a thing like a lot of our students are already in clicks, right? They already have their group on WeChat that they connect back and forth with informally. But for every five students in your course that, that are in a group or are connected and support each other, there's one or two or however many people that they are not part of a group. So, right, they don't have the connections. They aren't part of the sorority or fraternity or student group or residence hall group or, or whatever. They aren't part of that study group. So how they aren't benefiting from that social learning. So are there ways that you can create these things within the Canvas tools, within um, these formal spaces that are optional, but also sort of safe for them, um, where people can get in and, and jump in? Um, Piazza is a really great example of this. Um, over and over, I hear about interactions on Piazza um, by students who post anonymously because they're afraid to add their name to it. Um, and then people get in and, and then eventually, you know, they, they feel listened to, they feel like they're part of something, but something that they might have been afraid to join if they had to post or if they had to add their name to it. And Duncan, Duncan talks about UW-Madison Slack groups working on COVID. Um, so yeah, there are, there are these other groups and again, other platforms, um, I will say that are not supported by UW-Madison, just teaching and learning folks, um, even though there are these groups do exist on in at UW-Madison. I really like this last one, this last question here. I'd love to hear what people are saying. What silver linings have people seen as a result of this? I know some of my group have brought in outside experts that they otherwise would not have, which was a fantastic use for, for synchronous. That's a great use of synchronous or even asynchronous where they could uh, have a chance to talk with those guest speakers afterwards, teaching and professional development and students. So this is a great one. Anybody want to share what silver lining they've found? Jean. Yeah, um, as I was reading this question, I was thinking of one of the professors I'm working with who is an extremely powerful, dynamic, passionate, expressive lecturer. And she's wonderful to listen to and to watch. Her interactions with her students are really quite legendary. And this was terrifying to her moving into this um, online environment. And what she's realized, and it's been pretty exciting for her, is that she's really emphasized in her own teaching practice how to listen more and how to not be quite as much a performer as she is used to being. She gets tons of reinforcements for being this wonderful dynamic speaker, but what she realized is that she wasn't really listening to or even soliciting comments from her students as much as uh, she needed to. So it's been a, a light bulb event for her, even though she was you know, a reluctant participant in this internal exploration, but she's, she's grateful so far um, in that it highlights something about her own teaching style that she simply wasn't aware of. That's great. I'm wondering then for the future lectures if she's going to provide more opportunities for that listening and having students share. So that's that's really good because I was seeing a lot of our, uh, uh, there were still instructors who were doing the lecture capture. There are probably people who are used to doing the, the lecture. I saw there was some people that were doing that. So um, I was curious how this would go over for those who were heavy lecturers and what they would think about this new medium and breaking up the content. So here it is, instructors are being forced to try things they've never been interested in before. Once they try those things online, it's not so bad and the experience is actually helping them improve their course and teaching practice. Perfect. I love hearing that type of thing. Great. Any other silver, silver linings that uh, 
people have heard. It looks like Duncan wrote, sorry, I don't know if you're still having your video tech issues, but there's huge opportunities as folks everywhere go online and connect. Many of these are really about professional connection and appropriate if not required, better than purely socializing. Yes, Jean, did you have another comment? Oh, is that still your hand from before? Yeah. Uh, yep, I forgot to put my hand down. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Any other silver linings that people have seen? So I want to ask the folks, uh, the participants here, is there an example of um, a practice that you were afraid of um, coming into the remote teaching experience that you've gotten into it and now you're like, well, that wasn't so bad? Um, I guess that's part A of the question. Was there an experience and what was it? And then part B is how have how has it affected the way that you think about teaching? And what might you bring back to your face-to-face -face or blended um, teaching practice in the future? JT talks about Blackboard Collaborate Ultra with the stars in his eyes. <laughs> Microsoft Teams is one for me. Um, and the fact that they just allowed us, to, uh, just turned on the option to add a background um, background scenes has made it like, okay, let's dig into that a little bit more. Jean, go ahead. Yeah, what I have been doing is giving a great deal of feedback, written feedback to the assignments and the discussion posts that my students um, are required to offer. And what I realized I love about that is that it gives me a chance to be so much more thoughtful than you're able to be in class when you have to speak contemporary extemporaneously um, just off the top of your head. It, it, I think being able to write down comments is a more um, productive way to be kind and also specific to students. So as a result, now I'm aware that I do too much of that writing and I think students don't read everything that I have to write or have to say. So now I'm gonna do some audio feedback just to ah, switch just it out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and now I'm afraid that I'm gonna bumble because I'm now used to, you know, correct, auto, not auto-correcting, but correcting what I say because I want it to sound just right. I want to give the right message. So now I'm afraid of doing the audio feedback. But that's part of being human, right? We always fumble. If you, I barely am able to say coherent sentences. That's just part of who I am, despite my best efforts. And I saw Heidi's comment that uh, if you want to speak up, Heidi, about the one-on-one, uh, -on -one. how has that changed your experience with students? And Karen, I'll come back to you in a minute here. Heidi, did you want to expand on that? Sure. I tried to offer both, op well, I started with open office hours and found that only a small number of students were attending open office hours. So instead, I required uh, the students to come to 15-minute check-in appointments. And uh, I created a Google Docs sign-up sheet everyone signed up, every, everyone came to their appointments, and they had plenty of questions to ask and things to talk about. So making something, <laughs> making huh. that check-in mandatory, uh, but then also because it was one-on-one -on -one and it was private and they didn't have to share their video, they were very, they seemed to be very comfortable and um, we had just a really authentic, help, you know, meaningful um, check-in about their work. So I that's would, great. I, if, if you have the resources to do that, the time, my classes are small, so I am able to do that. So one, one, one way to build up on that, and, and I, I recognize that, um, so I've done this as well, but my courses were small. Like I never had more than 20 students whenever I tried to have mandatory office hours. And I, I recognize that I was forcing them to run across campus and meet me sort of on my terms or in, in neutral terms. Um, it's a lot easier in some ways to just sort of say, hey, sometime when you have computer access, um, jump in and, and let's have a quick little chat. It's not that hard. And I think that that's one of the things that people are recognizing is this, for me at least, this used to be very scary, the idea of, oh my gosh, I've got to figure out how's my microphone going to be working and will the camera be working? Which camera do I look at? And do I have the background? You know, what about my double chin and all this sort of stuff? We're getting more used to it now and we're getting more comfortable. And as we're getting more comfortable, it's changing the way that we can uh, 
connect with our students the way that we can connect with our instructors and the way that we can connect with each other. So if we do have more than 20 students or whatever, where it becomes difficult to meet individually with them in 15 minute check-ins, can we say, hey, meet as a group and talk about these items, maybe not specific to a course assignment, but about um, feedback on how is it going? How are you able to help each other? Sort of a more formalized version of what we were talking about before with the, the gathering folks together um, not to play guitar or to, you know, have fun, but to give them a, a, a focus uh, to come back and then re respond to you as a group, what are the things that you can do? Sorry, Karen, I, I totally interrupted your space. Not a problem. Karen Spader. Can you hear me? Uh, that would help. Okay. That's better probably, huh? Yes. Um, I was going to speak back to, now I forgot who it was, who was talking about it. Anyway, it was about leaving the uh, audio feedback. Um, having left audio feedback for several runs of a combi course, uh, I will say that don't fret about having everything be perfect. In fact, what students want to hear is your ramblings about their work. Um, what I found ended up happening over my experience leaving a ton of audio commentary was that I really did this as a kind of final response. I put in-text comments on their papers using SpeedGrader. I filled out a rubric and left comments specific to different rubric criteria. And then I just hit record and went off the top of my head of what I remembered and what stood out to me from their paper. Um, and of course, things like what if they really lost points on something that they were missing, obviously I would speak to that. But it was all off the cuff. And I think I would find myself saying in my audio comments, oh, but I'm just rambling now. So let's talk about this in more detail if I don't make sense or whatever else. I would, I would have those asides during my audio comments. So I guess my point is merely that when we let ourselves go deep in, a, in, in whatever it is we're talking about, I think we actually uncover more meaningful feedback that way, or at least I found I was. Um, and to cross over to Heidi's comment about one-on-ones, COMB courses also require one-on-one -on -one consults. And so I always held them after the rough draft was due, after I gave them my feedback, and they had to come to their one-on-one -on -one having listened to my feedback. And that's usually what we ended up talking about, any confusions they had. But most of the time what I heard was, no, your comments completely clarified all of the major issues that I was having in my work. Um, and of course, you know, we just kind of talked about other things. But anyway, I'm here to advocate for the completely off the cuff, rambling audio comments. Um, don't beat yourself up about it. I actually think students love it. Unless there's anything else about that or the um, silver linings, I'd love to move on to question four. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Hi, all. Um, I just had a, a silver lining to share, and, and that's um, watching so many instructors become more flexible in their deadlines and treating the the you know the giving the, the giving students the benefit of the doubt so much more about why they might not be able to do something by a certain time, and is bringing up the fact that it doesn't it often doesn't matter if a student learns something by a certain date you know, as long as they learn it. And I'm, I'm really happy to see people being very um, open and flexible and accepting work, you know, more on the student's terms and allowing them to kind of navigate through the assignments um, in a way that is less of a, you know, walk step marching forward, but saying, okay, you can, yes, you can give it to me a week later, as long as, you know, if you give it to me, it's still good. And um, I think that kind of outcome based approach is, is a really positive thing that I hope will continue. Great. And I think I captured that in part D. Dan, are you also responsible for number four there? A little time management for instructors? No, I, I think that was Lauren. Was that you, Lauren, that posted that? All right, Lauren. Yeah, that was me. So you, uh, 
How is this different from your face-to-face -face or your other, your the rest of your life, Lauren? <laughs> um, Have you not always been spending 12 hours a day on classes? <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> and um, no, what I'm what I'm thinking about um, and what has come up is that time management is obviously a bigger issue when you've got um, other people at home where you're trying to work, um, but yet you still want to spend your, you know, a reasonable amount of time. And I think actually while I, I probably did work that much, it wasn't as obvious because I was moving from place to place. You know, like I had a time when I was on campus doing my thing. And then I'd come home and I would, you know, do dinner, be with family, whatever. And just because of my bad habits, afterwards I'd pick up my computer and I would do more. And now I'm much more conscious of that because I'm in the same place all the time. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm typing it right now, um, newly established routines. Um, but that's kind of wrong. We haven't yet fully established these routines yet, right? Um, successful students and successful instructors, they've got time management figured out for a traditional standard teaching and learning situation, right? Now, all of a sudden, everything's been upended and disrupted, and we're all in this new environment, and we don't have these things down yet. We're all back to square one on on relearning in this for this new environment. Um, so it's 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 a time of chaos and change. Dan, go ahead. I, I um, totally relate to what Lauren's saying just from watching my wife work on her course where she's probably spending three times as much of her time in prep as she used to. And then also meeting with the students for the synchronous parts and recording the asynchronous parts and all. Um, and what I will say is that a lot of what I, what is going on right now reminds me of the work we do in REACH where there's a lot of front end work for, but if you can keep that value and like realize that parts of it are reusable, then creating all this stuff now is time hopefully saved or at least there won't be as much time needed down the line and it can be reused and shared. And so if people are creating good things now, um, I, I hope that they all that everybody also thinks of how to pass that on to other colleagues so that that value carries on beyond one semester and ends up being at times something that saves people time in the future. So, yeah, a lot of what a lot of that's learning, right? A lot of what we're doing right now is learning how to do this stuff, and it takes extra time and effort um, to learn how to do something. But then once we once we've done it once, it becomes easier. Once we do it twice, it becomes easier. And so it's it's hard at first, but it'll get better. Go ahead, Jean. Yeah, that reminds me of um, three summers ago when I was developing my first online course. Um, I wasn't paid to do any of that work. So I spent hours, hundreds, I felt like hundreds of hours. And I'll bet it was 100 hours developing that course. And Fast forward to three years hence, now people in my department really understand what it takes to develop a good online course and to develop the kind of curriculum and content that makes sense to use as teaching content. So, so we are all learning, including administrators and department folks who, who otherwise thought, well, just toss this course together and it'll be fine. Yeah, well now we're getting Think about all the all the new faculty, all the new TAs who are going to be coming to campus in late August and being handed a course. Um, not only are they being handed a discussion session and saying, go go teach this class or go uh, run this discussion session without enough training or um, prep time to be able to do this well, but it's going to be now go do this thing online um, in a, in a, a a medium that you might not have any experience in at all. Um, so yeah, this is going to be hard. Um, so save your best tips for the fall labs when we share with those new faculty who will be desperate for you know, what you've learned and for those stories. Go ahead, Karen. Oh, I just really like those two comments I wanted to combine here. What Jean was saying about all the 
time that she put into the course, but now that all that time is saved, you don't have to keep redoing it and redoing it. And what Lauren wrote here, that you can't reuse a live lecture. So to really think about what materials you don't have to focus as much on anymore because they're already done. So instead, you can focus on that time to give feedback to your students, the things that can be time consuming, but because you already have these other things done, you don't have to redo the lecture, you don't have to replan that lecture, you don't have to, you have most of your content, of course you'll update it, but now you can focus on what's really important in providing that useful feedback and communicating with your students. That's what I always find exciting about teaching online. You're always going to be updating your course, but I think that changes, you know, after you've taught it, you know, many times, and then you can focus on the communications part of it. So I think that's, I just wanted to tie those two comments together. Can I, can, uh, go ahead, Jean. Sorry, one more thing, and then I'll be quiet. Yeah, please. I also oh. want to put a plug <laughs> into your, um, your teach online courses, which were absolutely essential and heaven sent. At the time that I was developing this course, I was able to sign up for that, and it was just my salvation. It was fabulous. Yep, I, I suspect we'll see more and more um, offerings like that now um, as we do more and more pivoting to the online spaces, um, and that'll be great. Um, let me ask a quick poll here of the nine of you that are still here and including the four moderators. So two weeks ago, we were running 90-minute labs, and this week, or two, a, week and a week ago, we thought, well, maybe 90 minutes is too long. We've only been really talking for an hour. Um, but then this week, so this week we've been going with 60-minute labs, but I look at the time and I see that it's 2.10, and there are still some things that we can talk about. Should we go back to the 90-minute labs? Lauren? Um, this is more of a comment than an answer, and that is that the instructors that I work with, a lot of them are finding the same thing, that they'll plan like a 20-minute synchronous session and their students want to stay on, and next thing they know, they've been together for an hour. Yeah. So why not, I guess, an answer, if I were to answer your question, why not just set it for an hour? And for those who can stay on, kind of like the room is still open for another half hour if people want yeah. to hang out and talk more. I don't know. Okay, that's good. Um, and Margaret Murphy, your point is is really, I agree completely. That first week when we were doing 60-minute ones, we weren't doing breakouts as a regular part of it. Um, so I, I think that having that breakout time, the small group of sessions, uh, discussions, those are really valuable. But um, And they add to the time. They, they make this time more rich, I think. Well, John, I'm going to stop the recording now. We can still continue the conversation, but I'm going to stop.